Hello, my name is Deborah Ellis. I'm a teacher in Elicio in Vicenza and a textbook author for Lercia di Torre and Helpling Languages. Welcome back to From Time to Time a Poem. This fifth presentation intends to be one which teachers can offer to their fifth year students, preparing for the Esame di Stato, um, some ideas which can act as an extension to existing work with the teacher, or extra materials which um, students can investigate for themselves as homework, research work, for the oral exam. The poems I've chosen fit in well with work on war and conflict, or on women's rights, or on the relationship between nature and human feelings, particularly in the last poem. The title of the presentation is a line from one of the poems which I shall look at briefly, Damn the Shibboleth of Sex. Shibboleth referring to an outmoded belief or custom um, regarding women, basically that their role in war should be different from that of men. We always think of World War I as the moment when finally women stepped out of men's shadows. However, reading their poetry, we can see that this was far from a fait accompli. For us, the shibboleth of sex can also refer to the fact that women war poets are little known and rarely taught. Maybe we can redress that balance just by getting to know some of them and seeing what they can offer our programmes. The talk is divided into two parts. In part one, I'll present a cluster of poems on different issues and themes. Uh, in part two, there'll be an analysis of one poem particularly worthy of a look in much more detail. So why do women war poets so rarely appear in textbooks and anthologies? Firstly, they were not in that leading role as soldiers, so they could not be soldier poets. At the outset of war, uh, women's role was principally to keep the home fires burning, to maintain the homes of the men and the boys who had gone off to war so that they could return to the heart and hearth of their families when the fighting was over. As the war progressed, they moved into new roles, which, however, were very often seen as temporary. They were in the service of men who were doing the important jobs up front. As this poster says, the girls were behind the men who were behind the guns. Shadows, ever in the supporting role, never the lead. Secondly, as non-combatants, they did not die as what were seen as heroes. Although many women did die in the war, those working as nurses near the front, those at home who were victims of raids, those killed as they worked in factories serving the war machine. They are considered war casualties. They are not considered combatants, whose deaths are those of the brave heroes. So they were and are still seen as second class contributors who die non-heroic deaths. That said, um, I know the constraints of time on fifth year teachers and the reason we often do Brooks as soon Owen is because that's all we have time for. They are key poets of the period, or have become so to such an extent that they're hard to give up. However, I think it can be enlightening to discover how adding female poets um, can add depth and complexity to our view of World War I. We can, as teachers, get behind in support of the girl who was left behind and foreground her thoughts, her role, her literary expression. And we can do this by looking at some themes, issues, reflections, which run through women's war poetry. Now these include how women were used as instruments of recruitment or how they refused that role, how they were assigned roles thought appropriate to their sex or how they criticised those who didn't, how they entered roles which were very new for them, 
or how they seethed against the restrictions and laws which govern their capacity to contribute to the war effort and their reflections on what the war was all about and its worth or its worthlessness. So starting with women as instruments of recruitment. In newspapers, on posters, on newsreels, women were asked to contribute to the war effort by giving their menfolk, by not trying to stop them from serving. Their greatest sacrifice was to stand back, not to be possessive and cloying, but rather to encourage men to enlist. The message was that this sacrifice was right and that women would find men who heeded the call more attractive, enlisted men were the real men. In extreme cases, women's were, women were asked to ostracize, criticize, even publicly shame men who did not enlist. And we can see both sides of this coin in women's war poetry. Regarding World War I, there are two women's names which might be familiar. Um, Bira Britton, who also wrote war poetry, including a love poem called Perhaps, after the loss of her fiancé, and Scars Upon My Heart, after the loss of her brother. And, of course, Jessie Pope. Pope is one of the women you may well know, but why is that? Do you know her through a male poet? Is it because Owen's poem Dulce de Coromest was initially addressed to her? Uh, we know her as the butt of Owen's disgust. And this here, this poem, Who's for the Game, is an example uh, of the kind of poem she was publishing and for which she was receiving Owen's criticism, uh, in which she writes precisely as an instrument of recruitment, encouraging, pushing young men to join up. Who's for the game? Who's for the game, the biggest that's played, the red crushing game of a fight? Who'll grip and tackle the job unafraid? And who thinks he'd rather sit tight? Who'll tow the line for the signal to go? Who'll give his country a hand? Who wants a turn for himself in the show? And who wants a seat in the stand? Who knows it won't be a picnic, not much, yet eagerly shoulders a gun. Who would much rather come back with a crutch than lie low and be out of the fun? Come along, lads, but you'll come on all right, for there's only one course to pursue. Your country is up to her neck in a fight, and she's looking and calling for you. In poetic terms, the simple rhyme scheme, the lightness of the tone, to us might seem inappropriate to talk about war, but it is perfect for propagandizing. And look how she breaks her ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme, scheme just once here in the fifth to the last line to address the young men directly. Come along, lads, to cajole, to underline the shared view of what constitutes terrorism and what constitutes cowardice. And the choice of Lexus. Um, referring deliberately to war as a game, as a show, as fun. I mean, it's frightening and appalling to our eyes and ears, but very much in tune with public sentiment at that time. It was what people wanted to hear. And we call her jingoistic, a propagandist, and we dismiss her verse. She's vilified, ridiculed, but we forget that Pope was much more popular, familiar, much more widely read than Owen, say, at that time. We dismiss her naive patriotism, but we embrace that of Brooke. Instead, perhaps we should see her work as a social and cultural document as worthy of attention as other documents such as the war posters which give us insights into how people's minds were working or being made to work 
at that time. In strong contrast is Helen Parry Eden's poem. It has the title The Volunteer, which gives us expectations of a young man's willingness to become a soldier. But through the poem, we learn that the title is used ironically. Refusing the role of propagandist assumed by Pope, Eden shows us the truth behind some of the enlistments. Here, the volunteer has joined up despite having no desire to fight, despite being critical of the political and financial ends of war. And it is in the last lines of the poem that we understand why. The volunteer. He had no heart for war, its ways and means, its train of machinations and machines, its murky provenance, its flagrant ends. His soul, unpledged for his own dividends, he had not ventured for a nation, nation's spoils. Why had he sought the struggle and its pain? Lest little girls with linked hands in the lane should look, you did not shield us, as they wended across his window when the war ended. The idea of shame, personal and public shame, which forced many pacifists into arms and this fear of being shamed of being labeled a coward of being given the white feather literally or metaphorically comes across very clearly here so self-sacrifice could be staying at home to keep the home fires burning urging your men folk to enlist or as war progressed and the need became apparent, becoming an administering angel, that is to say, a nurse. In this period, the ideal man was the soldier, brave, strong, courageous, while the ideal, ideal woman was a nurse, compassionate, gentle, nurturing, and virtuous, but above all, selfless. Becoming, volunteering as a nurse was seen as fitting into an appropriate role which complemented a woman's femininity rather than undermining it. The opposite of these angels of compassion were the women who had demanded their independence, the unfeminine suffragettes, or those upper class women who were not prepared to give up their lives of self indulgence, who were not prepared for any self sacrifice, who instead continued to live their lives as though nothing had happened, socializing, going out dancing, and so on. In another poem by Jessie Pope, War Girls, we can see how this idea of sweet self sacrifice is reinforced through the picture of a woman who has perhaps volunteered as a nurse. War Girls. Beneath each uniform beats a heart that's soft and warm, though of canny mother wit they show no lack. But a solemn statement is this, they've no time for love and kisses till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. There, the uniform is a mere cover hiding the heart of a person born to be a mother, with all that capacity to nurture and to care. Notice how the uniform is temporarily there in this difficult period, but as soon as the war is over, it can be put to one side and women can return to fully being girlfriends, wives, mothers. And Jessie Pope not only becomes a supporter of the war effort through her poetry, but also a supporter of keeping women in their place, saying the things that men wanted to hear at that time. And I'd like to reinforce this idea of appropriate and inappropriate behaviours with a poem by Edith Sitwell. In literary terms, you'll see it is on a whole different level to Pope's work. And for me, it was surprising to learn that Edith Sitwell, um, one of the most extraordinary personalities of the first part of the 20th century, was also a war poet. Her work was often ambitious and experimental, and the dances, 
is no exception. She wrote this, as you can see from the subtitle, at the time of the Battle of the Somme, one of the most terrible battles of World War I, which saw 57,000 casualties on the first day of conflict, with that number rising to over a million men dead or injured by its end. Um, back home, civilians, maybe off-duty servicemen, enjoy music, dancing the night away. But how can this be? How can it be possible? How can people be dancing as thousands are being massacred, is the question she asks. <clears throat> the images of people dancing in the poem become ma macabre as they slide across the dance floor which swims with the blood of young men dying on their behalf. The dancer's self-indulgence and indifference becomes gruesome, a kind of madness in which they are parasites sucking the dying breath of soldiers, carrion flies feeding off soldiers' flesh. The dancers. The floors are slippery with blood. The world gyrates too. God is good that while his wind blows out the light for those who hourly die for us, we can still dance each night. The music has grown numb with death, but we will suck their dying breath, the whispered name they breathed to chance, to swell our music, make it loud that we may dance, may dance. We are the dull blind carrion fly that dance and batten. Though God die mad from the horror of the light, the light is mad too, flecked with blood. We dance, we dance each night. In these nightmarish images, we get the idea, the Yeatsian idea that the center cannot hold. There is something so basically wrong with life on earth that the planet is out of joint too. So another issue which emerges from women's war poetry is their anger and frustration at the status quo. Women were keen to support the war effort and many hoped it would be a time when stereotypes regarding gender roles would finally be broken down. The quotation on this slide, have a look at it, is part of a surprising story. Back in 1914, a group of women doctors offered their services to the war office. Women doctors. And the war office's reply was, go home and sit still. Women, doctors, keen to serve. And we need to remember this when we glorify this period as a time when women managed to upturn the apple cart of prejudice. Some poems by women show their frustration, uh, the fact that being born of one sex or the other could determine how much they could contribute to the war effort and how much they are allowed to live their lives. One such poem um, which shows this frustration and anger is this one, Drafts, which is in fact the poem um, which gave the title to this presentation. Um, in Drafts, Nora, bon Nora Bonford um, reflects on sex and gender roles. She considers the moment of a person's conception when his or her sex is arbitrarily determined and wonders how that arbitrary moment can then be responsible for such huge differences in the way lives are led. led. Drafts. Sex. Nothing more. Constituent no greater than those which makes an eyebrow slant or fall. In origin, sheet accident, which later decided the biggest difference of all. And through a war, 
involves the chance of death against a life of physical normality so dreadfully safe. Oh, damn the shibboleth of sex. God knows we've equal personality. Why should men face the dark while women stay to live and laugh and meet the sun each day? She doesn't glorify war. She refers to it as the dark, but she rails against the unfairness of men's lot compared to the normality that surrounds women's lives. She's angry that something decided by a kind of fate can determine such a huge difference, the biggest difference of all, that is living safely or risking your life each day. Uh, Rose McCauley's poem, also on gender restrictions, is a kind of letter from all the sisters at home, uh, of all the brothers, directed to all the brothers at the front. She talks to her own brother about how similar they were as children, how good she was at their play fights, their battles between toy ships in the bath. And she talks about various childhood incidents which show that she was as strong or even stronger than her brother and shows her anger that he is at the front facing the enemy and she is at home. When we fought campaigns in the long Christmas rains with soldiers spreading troops on the floor, I shot as straight as you. My losses were as few, my victories as many, or more. And when in naval battle, amid cannons rattle, fleet met fleet in the bath, my cruisers were as trim, my battleships as grim, my submarines cut as swift a path. Or when it rained too long, and the strength of the strong surged up and broke away with blows, I was as fit and keen, my fists hit as clean, your black eye matched my bleeding nose. Was there a scrap or ploy in which you, the boy, could better me? You could not climb higher, ride straighter, run as quick, and to smoke made you sick. But I sit here, and you're under fire. Naively, she does infer, as the poem goes on, that he, her brother, is having all the fun while she has to stay home and knit socks. But we can really sympathise with this young woman who is bursting to serve. To, she's fit, she's strong, and she's unable to fill, fulfil a kind of vocation her, um, and do her duty alongside her brother. Of course, changes did occur. Women took on new roles across the board as more and more men were called up. A huge number, as you can see here, um, filled roles in banking, finance and commerce. And it is this group who were more likely to continue in those jobs after the war ended. The largest number of uh, new women workers were those employed in munitions factories, where the girls were known as munitionettes. Interestingly, they were all forced to give up their jobs when the war ended. The government, uh, not because of the end of the production of munitions, of course, the factories switched back to their original production lines, but the government had negotiated with the trade unions to ensure that after the conflict was over, the women would leave and their jobs would be once again filled by men. Hmm. The, the figures above are interesting, but they do not reflect the wide range of jobs which women had to or were keen to fill. And for more information, we can look back again at uh, another social document, uh, a Jesse, Jesse Pope poem, which we men the one we mentioned before, uh, War Girls. Here, 
Pope offers an excellent social cultural document listing many of the roles which women had taken on uh, in an accomplished manner. They could do the jobs just like men in adverse weather conditions, denying their delicacy, emphasizing their strength, fitness, determination or grit and energy, shouting and whistling like men, God forbid. And here she talks about how women have finally broken free of the bonds of their sex. War girls. There's the girl who clips your ticket for the train and the girl who speeds the lift from floor to floor. There's the girl who does a milk round in the rain and the girl who calls for orders at your door. Strong, sensible and fit, they're out to show their grit and tackle jobs with energy and knack. No longer caged and penned up, they're going to keep their end up till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. There's the motor girl who drives a heavy van. There's the butcher girl who brings your joint of meat. There's the girl who cries, all fares please, like a man. And the girl who whistles taxis up the street. So women have finally broken the bonds of their sex. They're challenging gender stereotypes. But then in a sense, she contradicts herself. She seems to celebrate this new freedom but then has to assure men that, of course, this is only until the boys come back. A necessary fill-in. Women are stepping up, but they will, of course, then step down. Jessie Pope is expressing the ideas people wanted to hear. She's not undermining the status quo, but she takes some risks when she calls women strong, capable of doing heavy work, when she says women can shout and whistle like a man. She, in a sense, epitomizes the changes in society at the time and the fears which that change elicited. I listened to this letter from a young soldier at the front to his girlfriend, which really underlines those fears. A letter from a soldier to his girlfriend. Whatever you do, don't go in munitions or anything like that. Just fill a woman's position and remain a woman. Don't develop into one of those things that are doing men's work. I want to return and find the same lovable little woman that I left behind. Not a coarse thing, more of a man than a woman. I love you because of your womanly little ways and nature. So don't spoil yourself by carrying on with a man's work. It's not necessary. <laughs> um... Madeline Ida Bedford turns her attention fully to the girls working in munitions factories, the munitionettes. Um, working in the factories could be very unpleasant, uncomfortable, and often very dangerous. The female workers had limited protection against toxic chemicals used in production, and more than 200 women lost their lives through accidents, explosions or poisoning. Bedford's biography um, shows that although she was not working class, she may well have worked in a munitions factory and her workmates would have been from a variety of social backgrounds. And she chooses to talk about the work in the factory from the point of view of a working class girl who perhaps for the first time in her life has a minimum of financial independence, thanks to the job. Uh, she doesn't pretend she's serving the country for some greater good. She just says she's willing to risk her life. She knows she is at risk in the factory, but she's willing to chance it. And in return, she gets her just reward, her money, five pounds a week, which she spends on good times and clothes. Munition wages. Earning high wages? Yeah, five quid a week. A woman too, mind you. I calls it dumb sweet. You're asking some questions, but bless you, here goes. I spends the whole racket on good times and clothes. Me saving? Elijah. You don't think I'm mad? I'm acting the lady, but I ain't living bad. 
I'm having life's good time, so here, it's like this. The youth comes a danger, a touch-and-go biz. We're all here today, mate, tomorrow, perhaps dead. If fate tumbles on us and blows up our shed. Afraid? Are you kidding? With money to spend? Years back I wore tatters, now silk stockings, my friend. I don't know if you knew that um, VAD nurses were, could not be working class girls. Uh, only girls from a certain uh, class background. Um, because working class girls were considered too immoral for the role to be closing, working closely with uh, young men. Look here how in the poem um, Bedford uh, underlines that the girl, she's having fun with her money, but she is not being immoral. She's acting the lady, but she isn't living bad. And um, this idea of morality and immorality is really interesting. Finally, I wanted to read two more poems, which are more lyrical and which reflect on the worth of ore. This is a quotation from one of the two, and not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it's done. The first poem, however, is called Dulce et Decorum, and it can stand as a kind of sister poem to that of Owen, for its harshness of its description of a dead soldier. Dolce et decorum. We buried our dead, the dearest one said to each other, here then let him lie, and they may find their place when all is done, from the old may tree standing guard nearby. Strong limbs were on the wasted lifeblood dries, and soft cheeks that a girl might wish her own, a scholar's brow or shadowing valiant eyes. Henceforth shall pleasure charnel worms alone. For we that loved him covered up his face, and laid him in the sodden earth away, and left him lying in that lonely place to rot and moulder with the mouldering clay. The second underlines the indifference of nature to this huge trauma that humans are living through. Teasdale sees how the passing of time will leave no trace of conflict and that nature would not mind at all if the human race destroyed itself completely. There will come soft rains. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound and frogs in the pools singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it's done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone.